a lot of people get completely derailed by injuries because they just don't know how to manage them very well. As much as I wish it weren't true, injuries are probably going to be a part of training. And if we don't know how to manage them, then we're never going to really make long-term progress. Welcome or welcome back to Trail and Ultra Running Training. My name is Will Franz. I'm a running coach and a strength coach, and I've helped athletes get stronger and improve their performance in distances ranging from 5Ks to 200 miles. And the whole goal of this podcast is to help you train a little better so you can improve your performance and have more fun out on the trails. If you like the information, I'd really appreciate it if you hit subscribe or follow or leave a rating or review or just share it with somebody. Just spread the information so that more people see it. That's all I ask. Anyway, today let's talk about training through injuries. And before I get into this, I want to get the like very clear mandatory disclaimer. Go see someone if you're injured. If you're injured, go see a doctor or a PT or someone who can give you a medical diagnosis so that you know what you're working with. Do not take personalized medical advice from some random fucking guy on a podcast. That should be the mantra that I think everyone, myself included, um, should probably tattoo on themselves as they move through the modern universe because it is very easy to do because we, our medical system, especially in this country, is not stellar. And as a result, we, uh, it's very easy to go for the podcast guy recommendations, myself included. So podcasts are great. I listen to a lot of them. As you can tell, I have one. I like the medium. But in the past, I put way too much stock into them, well more than they deserved, and it didn't have great effects. So go see someone. And if they aren't very good at their job, then try to find someone else. Now, I realize um, when we look at the injury thing, it can be very cyclical as an athlete. You train, you get injured, you take some time off, you recovered, etc. And it can be really difficult to make long-term consistent progress month after month or year after year if you're constantly trapped in this cycle, right? So here's what I tend to see. You're training, you get injured, they take time completely off where they sit on the couch and try to recover and have no pain. They get back to training and think, oh, I've lost a lot of fitness, which maybe, depending how long you took off, if you took multiple weeks completely off, then we're going to see a drop in fitness. It doesn't mean you can't build it back, but it is going to be hard. This is when, um, because we usually have a race coming up, uh, they panic, they train even harder, get injured again, and then we just repeat this cycle until either miss the race or decide that, like, I'm just no, not built for this sport and quit, or any of these things, right? And we should definitely talk about that, because it is not, it's not true. It's not that you're not built for the sport. It's very likely that you'd be fine as a runner. It's just we don't actually train super well a lot of the time in the social media world, or in general, right? Um, most of us start out too fast. We get this big goal that we want to do. We sign it for a marathon with like four months to go, which is just not enough time from the couch, but that's beside the point. Or you're running and you've been a bit of a runner, but you've taken a couple years off and you want to get back to it. And we, we go big and then we push really hard. We don't do any zone two training or we do all zone two training and like never do speed work. So the first time you run faster, you tear your so as like Kevin Hart, I don't know, like ease into all the stuff. And when we look at training, we need to realize that it probably is going to take longer for you to hit your goals than you want it to, right? Like when I talk to people, especially when they're coming back from an injury, I don't think I've ever had anybody follow a return to run program as written. And this includes mine, which is much more liberal than many of them. Some of them are insane. They take like three to four months to get you back to a standard running volume, which is to me nutty. Uh, and I, a lot of PTs that I really respect would agree. I like a much more tiered system. Um, if you need one of these, DM me, I'll send it to you. I just have been too lazy to actually make it pretty. So it's not anywhere on the internet, but I have a free return to run program that'd be more than happy to send to you if you're looking for it post injuries. 
But I like more of a tiered system where if you can accomplish level one or tier one, then take a day off and do day two, right? And if we look at a 10 tiered system, you can be back to running really well in 20 days, which is three weeks. If it doesn't go perfectly smoothly, then it might take a little longer than that. But we're not talking about four months unless you really have an issue that is preventing you from running and we just shouldn't be out there in the first place, right? Like if you have a stress fracture or something, then we actually do need to take time off. And if we're trying to be really responsible and things keep happening or you keep having the same pain, then maybe you have a stress fracture. But if we're just pushing too hard because we're impatient and not willing to build ourselves back up and be responsible, then we're going to end up with issues, right? Now, if we are injured, we can look at a few different things. One of the things would be try to get moving as normally as possible as soon as possible. This was a big thing for my dad when he was a PT, and thankfully this has started to become a little more standard course. Um, I have more to say on this, but we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, but like movement itself is an analgesic, which means it is inherently pain relieving. They have done studies on this. They've done anecdotes. They've done all sorts of case stuff, right? Like we, if you move, you will be in less pain to a point. But a lot of the time I have people come into the gym and they have knee pain or whatever, and they leave feeling better than they came in. And it wasn't magic. It's just that they spend most of their day sitting at a desk for like eight to 10 hours and they have some arthritis and their fucking knee hurts because they haven't moved all day. And then they come into the gym and we do some leg extensions and a couple like really easy squats and then they leave feeling better. We'd probably have really similar thing uh, targets if they ended up actually walking five, six, 7,000 steps a day. There'd be a lot less pain. But it can be really hard to move when you're in pain. And we can see the same thing we're looking with or looking at training, looking at coming back to running, or looking at like improving through an injury. To heal faster and to maintain what you have, or hell, to heal maybe even a little bit slower, but not lose a lot of progress, then you're going to have to be okay with a little pain. If we look at something like plantar fasciitis, it is probably going to take months to get better. If you believe that what's it called, fixing your feet book, I think they put it out at two years. It seems a little long to me. Um, I just had a couple people with it and it took them about six months um, of really like dedicated, do work, fix the problem. If you are peaking towards a marathon or an ultra and you have plantar fasciitis, I really wouldn't expect it to get a lot better unless you want to like defer your race. But we're it doesn't have to be horrendous. It doesn't have to get way worse. We don't have to see this big drop or in uh, performance. We don't have to be in pain all the time. We just have to understand that it's probably going to hurt a little bit because the standard recommendation for injury treatment is going to be like a four out of 10. And I'll get to, I'll get back to this, but like a four out of 10 is not a zero, probably going to hurt a little bit. Now, when we are training, be it lifting or whatever, like I threw my back out a little bit uh, recently and I didn't stop moving. I just adjusted the pattern. Now, for about five days, I took some rest. Most of my movement was moving stuff around for clients. And then I made stuff easier for myself, but it was still hard. I was still working hard in the gym. I just adjusted what I was doing, right? So for lifting, you could demo for me. This might, instead of doing some kind of squat, we might do a leg press because it doesn't require that internal stability, right? So if my back hurts, I can lay on the leg press. It will create the support for me. And then I can just train my legs. For running, we might shorten the intervals or increase the rest period and then still get a really similar stress in the system, right? So if we look at, standard VO2 max workout, 
in the trail world at least, it would be like five by three minutes or five by three minute hills with some kind of three minute rest period. It is in Coop's book. A lot of people use it. it doesn't. They use it for a good reason. It's really good. It hits right in that like 12 to 18, 20 minutes of total VO2 max space. And it pretty much guarantees that if you hold a hard pace for those three minutes, then we're going to be cranked up into some level of pace that will develop your VO2 max. Now, something else that can really push VO2 max would be something like 8 to 12 repeats of one minute hard with one minute rest periods. And it's pretty likely that your first uh, interval might not do a lot to get you into VO2 max. It might be a little too short, but the rest periods are really short. And as you aggregate over the first, maybe we get past the first one or two or three repetitions, then the rest of them are going to be there, right? So we're not getting as much volume VO2 max, but we can still push a stimulus. We can still do some work that's really difficult, but without quite as, without having to hold it quite as long. And depending what the injury is or depending what the problem is, that can really matter. Because if we look at like, core stability, then that's going to break down more over time, right? We're going to see a lot more anteriorly tilted pelvis, if you heard my last episode, uh, and inability to run well um, later in the race than we will earlier. So both of these things will deliver a stimulus in the right effort range. Might be different, might not be quite as much. One might be a little easier than the other, but it will deliver a stimulus. We can also get on the bike. If you can't run, then let's pop on a bike or if, or the stair mill or whatever, depending what your injury is, that might be a decent call or the elliptical, right? We can still get the heart rate up to deliver a really good stimulus, even if we can't actually run at the moment. I think a lot of the time, especially, well, a lot of time period in all of life forever, but especially when it comes to injury stuff right now, um, we make the perfect the enemy of the good. We can't run, everything hurts, we can't do whatever, so we just don't do anything instead of realizing that we might have a longer term goal or um, we don't want to lose our fitness or hell, biking can actually be kind of fun, right? Like, I don't know what to tell you. We have to be flexible because you're probably, again, going to get kind of hurt as you train. And there's good reason for that. But um, it is largely because training is unpredictable. Now, look at an injury treatment protocol really fast. You are doing something. Let's say you're doing speed work and you have this sensation of like, ah, that feels kind of shitty on the bottom of my heel. Your first response should be to stop. I think this is, this is the exact moment where we tend to make a lot of mistakes. We don't stop. We think, oh, I have a race, or we're in that panic mode, or we need to do whatever we need to get done. And as a result, we push too hard, we push too long, we push ourselves into this chronic injury territory, right? And at the point where we actually admit to ourselves that there's a problem, it is so deep. If we just took a break, took a day off, took an unplanned rest day, ate a shitload of food and took a nap, um, or took it really, really light, then we might be able to prevent this from becoming something bigger, right? Like we don't always need to end up with Achilles tendinopathy just because we have a bit of calf pain. We can take a day off and hope that it writes itself, and it often will, right? Now, if we are past that point of chronic injury, then just two weeks, two weeks, by the way, not 12 months, two, two weeks, um, then we want to keep pain at a four out of 10 or below. Now, what is that? Nobody knows what that means. I've gone on about this multiple times, but four out of 10 or below on the general judgment that a zero out of 10 is like sunshine and rainbows and happiness. And then a 10 out of 10 is often counted as like a broken femur or actively passing a kidney stone or a really difficult childbirth. That's a 10 out of 10. Getting shot. These are all the things that tend to frame a 10 out of 10. So four out of 10 on that scale isn't great. It's not 
It's not prohibitive. It's not really damaging your performance, but it doesn't feel good, right? It's probably not wincing, but it's also probably not smiles. Now, let's look at the back injury I mentioned that I got almost two weeks ago. It is healed now, as of like a day or two ago. Um, I was squatting weight. Um, it was a reduced range. We don't need to get super into my training because it's really boring to me, and it probably doesn't apply to anybody else because I don't have the same goals as most other people. So I was squatting some heavy amount of weight uh, for what's called a pin squat, which is a reduced range of motion working on like final extension. And it was heavy. And I didn't brace my core for the first rep, which is just stupid. I was not doing a stupid exercise. Squatting is not inherently like deeply dangerous. I just made a lapse of judgment. It's kind of like looking up at a bird and then tripping in a hole on the trail, right? Things happen. They could have been prevented. I definitely could have been smarter, but it wasn't the exercise itself. I just did it stupidly. Um, which, side note, we should respect that there is some inherent danger in training, right? It's not that the movement's problematic. It's that if we don't do it well or lose focus, then things can be less than ideal, right? Um, this is why we often get injured. I know so many more people who get hurt, like, putting their weights away because they just kind of throw themselves at the uh, weight rack than I do know people who hurt themselves like doing a deadlift, right? I know bodybuilders who will deadlift 600 pounds and then throw out their back by twisting to reach for shampoo in the shower. It's these motions that we don't often train. It's these movements or these moments where we're not really paying attention. And this is where we often tend to get hurt, right? It's largely a lack of focus or being outside of our general range of training. So once we, like, back to the, back to the problem at hand, two hours after the injury, I had to lift weights and demonstrate a deadlift for a client. My back was not stellar, but as long as I braced really well, it was fine. Um, I didn't miss work, and that's not an I'm so tough statement. It's far from it. I was groaning around and acting like an idiot, um, but it didn't hurt. It just required a lot of breath heavy breathing and bracing, and this is all to illustrate that a lot of low-intensity movement, whatever that may mean for you, is really actually helpful to recovery. I healed faster than, like, the worst pain I was in was in the morning after resting all night. By moving throughout my day, by putting weights away for people, by, like, being safely, by being responsible, but still, like, moving things and demoing exercises and doing deadlifts and putting my back through some level of work, it healed well. And it also pointed out and kept me in touch with when it fully healed. Right? Like there were moments where I thought it would be fine. Like after the initial shock went away over a few days, um, there were moments where it really felt fine kind of moving around through my day. And then I'd pick up something for a client and realize like, oh, we're not, we're not fully there yet. Right. But I wasn't back to training. I wasn't in a situation that was dangerous. And it just allowed me to kind of like dictate my training a little more. And because it was in my low back on one side, like it meant I didn't sprint for a while. I was still like moving and I was able to get on the stair stepper, I held onto the handles, which I usually don't do, but it was really good here because it allowed me to support my back. I got on the bike a little bit um, and like maintained effort throughout the thing without really losing a lot. And in fact, today I had one of the better VO2 workouts, whatever better means. I mean, it was, it was awful, but performance-wise, is one of the better, like, high-intensity workouts I've had in a while. So I've done both versions of this. I have taken advice from other professionals. And this was a long time ago. This is no longer really industry standard, but to, like, rest and do nothing and ice it. And then my dad would usually call someone a fucking idiot, um, Eh, his words, and not that I disagree, and he'd tell me, get back to normal movement as quickly as possible, 
remember when I really sprained my ankle pretty badly and they told me I was on crutch. I told him I was on crutches and in a boot and he said, get out of that thing as fast as you possibly can or it's very likely you're going to end up with hip issues. Now, I have a f friend right now who's in a boot and it's really appropriate for her, right? She has a fracture in her foot. So it's not that it's always bad, but the faster we can get back to normal movement, the faster we can get like back to some semblance of nor uh, normalcy of like getting through our day and putting the body under some low level of stress, the faster we're going to tend to heal. And to be clear, those treatments like the sit on the couch and rest treatments aren't really in fashion anymore because it's been proven correct over time. So as an athlete, you should expect to get injured. And I say that because like most people do. And when that happens, it is easy to ask yourself, is there anything I could have done to prevent this? And the answer is probably yes, if we ask could. But if we ask, should you have? Probably not. Like sometimes we learn about physical deficiencies because something goes wrong. And if you spent three to four hours per day doing all the stretching stuff in the world and like preventative PT, restorative rehab, whatever we want to call it, movement, then yeah, maybe it's very possible that if we did isometric calf raises and isometric split squat, uh, squat holds for our tendon in our knees and we did a bunch of stuff for our hips and we spent every day doing airplanes and we did a lot of a lot of this restorative stuff we might get injured less but even then it's not a guarantee and worst worst coach in the world is someone who's like oh i could have prevented that injury that guy sucks right like it's just they're insufferable and it's it's often not true because we're trying to predict stuff with 2020 hindsight stuff happens and i'm not saying we shouldn't try like, we should definitely do the strength work and do the stretching. And if you have shitty range of motion, then yeah, right? Like, if we're, if we're running and we need to be able to use our glutes to run well and you can't get hip extension behind your back, then we should be doing couch stretches every day until we have better hip extension. Um, otherwise, you're just going to probably strain your Achilles or hurt your back or do something else that's going to compensate there. But... If it seems like you're moving well, and then one day, like either in peak week or on a particularly hard workout, or hey, I didn't sleep super well and something just didn't go right, and you still get injured, I think that's really normal. And you are going to experience some niggles from time to time, especially as we come through the upper ends of training. We can reduce that likelihood a lot by actually staying focused when we train and eating well and recovering and staying hydrated and doing all the stuff. But at the end of the day, injuries are, are likely as an athlete. Now, when we're lifting, let's make sure all your lifting looks the same. Even the warm-up sets, focus on form. Focus on form when you're running. See how your body feels. Don't just zone out, like zone in. Zone into training, get lost in the training. Don't like use it to or do whatever one, right? Like you're an adult. But if we really want to prevent injury, then we want to like zone in and check in with ourselves and make sure that we're like using it to uh, assess constantly. Now, I don't want this to be a doom thing either. Like we should, just because injuries are likely to happen, we should also do our damn just to keep them small and keep recovery time short. I'm not a fan of the like, as I said earlier, push through it until we end up with whatever. Like, as I said, chronic injuries are anything past two weeks. If we can take a day off or take an unplanned rest day or two or three, um, it is worth it. It is worth the trade-off to not have to deal with tendon repair. But if we're past that, then let's try to keep moving. Moving is helpful. Don't be dumb. Don't push through pain and break your feet, but stay moving, right? Like, don't make perfect the enemy of the good. Adapt training how we can. Let's reduce the pattern, adjust the intervals, do what we need to do. 
And if you don't know how to do any of that correctly or aren't quite sure what your recovery might look like, then read a bunch of training books. Like I'm staring at them right now. They're above, they're above my screen. Like read the one by Jason Koop. Check out some strength stuff. There's a really good one by Richard Blagrove that I think is a little out of date, but it's like strength training for runners or endurance athletes or something. Running Your First Ultra by Kersey Mill. All of these can be a really good place to start. But at the end of the day, if you want some help, like message me. If I can fix a problem in five to 10 minutes, I will always do that for free. And once we get to the training thing, like you should also expect that recovery might take a while. I try all the time to under promise and over deliver. And as much as I would love to not say the sentence that plantar fasciitis takes six months to recover from, it probably does. It might take longer. Uh, it probably takes about that long if we're going to do it well. So finally, my last bullet here before I close out. Once you have a movement or a therapy that works, keep doing it longer than you think you need to. I think this is one thing that we all kind of make mistakes on, where if we have chronically tight hip flexors or whatever that are preventing hip extension, if the couch stretch feels like shit, um, but you are seeing some progress on it, and then doing it for a couple weeks really helps improve your pain, keep doing it. Like, don't just stretch them while you're in pain. Stretch them every day until the couch stretch is easy. If we are struggling to use our glutes, then let's make sure that lower abdomen and that pelvic positioning is second nature. Don't just do it for like two weeks and call it a day. Do it constantly until it doesn't matter, until it feels like a waste of time, and then probably do it for another month. And then occasionally check in to make sure it hasn't returned to like this baseline where we often end up. Pain is often the last symptom to arrive and the first symptom to leave because pain is often the like outcome of weeks or months or years of movement patterns that are less than ideal. I heard that for the record from a guy named Jordan Genta that works with the prescript people who I've currently gone through a bunch of search from, right? Well, like once the pain is gone, we often still have a lot of work to do unless we want it to come back. Really good example here that I can show on camera is like sometimes we'll have pain like radiating down through the arm or in the front of the shoulder. And this will often come from a scapula that doesn't know how to move well. And we can often fix this pain by like getting some level of shoulder extension, but just because that's better doesn't mean your shoulder actually moves well. <laughs> we should fix the shoulder so that we can get really good shoulder extension. If the pain goes away when we're like here sitting in front of you, we still have scapula stuff. So we should fix that so that the pain doesn't come back. Otherwise, we're just going to be chasing our tail forever, right? Anyway, I probably have a lot more to say on injuries. It's a topic that is near and dear to me as someone who has probably had some level of injury to almost every joint in my body. Um, and it is a thing that I am passionate about helping people fix because when I'm injured, I can't move well. And when I can't move well, I get really depressed. So if you, like me, um, use movement as some level of mental health management, you probably get that. Anyway, uh, if you have questions or whatever on this, please shoot me a message. Um, shoot me a DM on Instagram. I'm not on Facebook very much just because I don't like it. Um, I am on email. If you're on my email list, feel free to email me. Or you can click the show notes that says interested in coaching. And then you can, when you click that button, it'll take you to a form and that will set some time in my calendar. Anyway, I am... Right now, probably as this releases, probably setting up for Javelina 100 to crew someone. If you're going to be there, hit me up. I would love to meet you. I will have a lot of time where I'm just sitting in the desert hanging out um, while someone else runs really far. So if you're going to be there, message me. I'd love to meet you. And otherwise, I hope you have a great day. And go have some fun on the trails. And uh, hope you don't get injured. See ya. 
Thank you again for listening to the Trail and Ultra Running Training Podcast. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Just a reminder, nothing you hear on this podcast is medical advice, and you should always speak with a medical professional before making changes to your training or your nutrition. If you enjoyed the podcast or found it helpful, please leave a rating or review. It tells the algorithm robots that people like it, and that means more people will hear it. Or even better, just share it with someone who you think would benefit. If you prefer a video version, head to the Trail and Ultra Running Training Group on Facebook, or check out the Mountain Goat Endurance Coaching YouTube channel. Thank you again, and I hope you have a great next run.